வணக்கம் அண்ட் குட் ஈவினிங் வெல்கம் டு எவ்ரி ஒன் ஐம் சுபயா லக்ஷ்மணன் அண்ட் ஐ வில் பி யோர் ஹோஸ்ட் ஃபார் டு நைட்ஸ் இவெண்ட் த டைட்டில் ஆஃப் டு நைட்ஸ் இவெண்ட் தமிழ் அண்ட் சான்ஸ்கிரிட் த டூ ஐஸ் ஆஃப் ஷிவா ஹேஸ் அட்ராக்டட் சம் அட்டென்ஷன் இன் த பில்ட் அப் டு திஸ் இவெண்ட் இட் இஸ் அ கலர்ஃபுல் டைட்டில் மென் டு பிக் த இமேஜினேஷன் இட் இஸ் இன்ஸ்பயர்ட் ஃப்ரம் அ கோட் ஃப்ரம் த சிவ பை ஃப்ரம் சிவஞான முனிவர் ஆஃப் த செவன்டீன் ஹண்ட்ரட்ஸ் it is from his work kanji puranam verse 2269 in tamil it reads irumolikkum kannudalar mudar kuravar which in english translation is the forehead eye progenitor of both languages now uh, let us welcome uh, uh, professor george hart he is based in florida and it is 8:30 am for him right now so firstly i want to thank him for adjusting his daily schedule to accommodate this event this is also the main reason why the event is at 8:30 pm uh, in singapore okay while i introduce uh, uh, professor hart and go through his biography i will also highlight some of the special qualities about him Firstly he started his career as a scholar of Sanskrit he got his phd in sanskrit from harvard university in 1971 he then taught sanskrit at the university of wisconsin madison he could have continued his career in sanskrit which had good career prospects uh, where there were many academic positions in this field particularly in the 1970s but instead at medicine he fell in love with tamil and his lovely tamil wife kausalya from madurai he switched to tamil and studied tamil under professor a k ramanujam a multilingual scholar and prolific translator of classical works professor hart was smitten and was inspired by professor ramanujam so he too became a multilingual scholar and a translator of classical works there being few academic opportunities for tamil in the 1970s he paved his own path by founding the tamil department at the university of california berkeley and was its chair in tamil studies till his retirement a few years ago he has written many books just to name a few uh he he uh, co-translated the first complete full english translation of the purananuru the purananuru is a 400 poems from the sangam age which is dated about 300 bc he also translated the forest book of the kamba ramayanam in sanskrit he wrote a rapid sanskrit method in 1984 and he also wrote uh, his seminal work the relationship between tamil and classical sanskrit literature many of these books are available at the nlb now thirdly upon discovering the depth of tamil literature he has been an independent early advocate of tamil as one of the world's classical languages together with sanskrit chinese greek latin hebrew and persian he has been a consistent voice for tamil's recognition as a classical language for 40 years it was in recognition of this that the tamil nadu government approached him in 2000 to write a letter to support its efforts to have tamil recognized as a classical language in india the official letter he wrote was released by the university of california berkeley in 2004 the indian government gave tamil the status of a classical language equal to sanskrit in its citation it mentioned that professor hart's letter was one of the key documents that influenced its decision for this every tamilian surely will have feelings of appreciation towards him if you want to read it later you can just google professor hart's uh, letter on tamil and uh, you should be able to find it on the internet to complete his biography he is a polymath conversant in the languages and literatures of greek latin russian french 
and German. In Indian languages, he has extensively looked into the literatures of Malayalam and Telugu in English translation. So he has a truly astounding perspective of the ancient classical literatures of Europe and India. Surely, Professor Hart, with his deep and broad knowledge, is a rare scholar who can look through both of these eyes, Tamil and Sanskrit. Okay, there, there will be a Q&A session after the talk and you, uh, you all are welcome to post your questions in the chat box. Without further ado, let's give Professor Hart a warm welcome. Yellowrakum vanakam. Namaskar Omi. I use both Tamil and Sanskrit because today we're talking about both languages. Um, Nan Mudala Tamil Silvate Kale Solo Sot Kale Solo Virumbigirin Tamur Mahi Mayundi Yelaro Tamur Rumba Parumayana Mori Yandre Tain the Kurvom Yurundalom Tamur in Mahi May Adanodia Uh, um, let me switch to English. Uh, I'm used to speaking English, not so much Tamil. Um, when we think of Tamil, we really, um, it, it's become common for people to think of the language as being very old. And it's true, it is quite old, as we'll see in a minute. But the greatness of Tamil is not its age, it is its literature and its culture. So let me go on and let's talk about two languages, Vardamori and Tenmori, the Northern language and the Southern language. If you think about it, these two titles of the language indicate a kind of equality of status, don't they? One of them is Vadamori, one of them is Tenmori. It doesn't say one is better or one is worse. It simply puts them together. Let's, uh, let me move on to a quotation from the great Sanskrit poet Magha, who wrote, wrote one of the Pancha Mahakavyas, in Tamil, we have Aimbiram Kapiyangar, and Sanskrit also has Pancha Mahakavyas, five great Kavyas. And what I would, the reason I'm starting with this quote is that I think it forms a basis for looking at and understanding old Tamil. Um, what Maga wrote is a very famous quote. Chane chane annavatamu paiti tareva rupam ramaniyatayaha. Something which becomes new every moment, it, or what becomes new every moment is the very form or the very essence of beauty. Now, as we go on, let's keep that idea in mind. Because uh, because when we look at literature and poetry uh, or any literature, what ultimately is important is that the literature becomes alive, that it appeals to us in a way uh, that, that is living, not that we simply put together words and understand what they mean as if we were reading a income tax code or a legal document, but a way that really speaks to us. Uh, and that's what Maga is talking about in this quote. Now, first of all, let's talk a little bit about classical language. 
Um, a, these are, you know, there is no ultimate definition of what makes something classical or not. But uh, I think a classical language should at least satisfy three things. It should be old, it should be independent, and it should have some influence. Now, one of the things that is not well known about Tamil is how important it has been for the development of Indian culture. We all know that Sanskrit is a critically and basic element of South Asian culture. But when I say Tamil also is, people will scratch their heads and say, that doesn't sound right. Uh, but the fact is that when we look at the great Tamil poet saints, the Arvars and the Nayanmars, they have had an enormous influence on India. Uh, the Arvars catal uh, catalyzed the development or the writing of the Bhagavatam. And it's been shown that the Bhagavatam is full of elements from the Arvars. The Arvars themselves took many of their ideas and their themes from older Tamil and especially Sangam literature, which we'll come to in a bit. When we come to the Shaiva saints like Manikavasa and the three authors of the Devaram, we also have uh, enormous influence on later Indian developments. Um, if we talk about the Arvars, uh, I think we can say that without the Arvars, there would have been no Tulsidas and no Tulsidas Ramayanam, because Tulsi was very, very uh, indebted not only to the whole Vaishnava tradition and to those elements of the tradition that were started by the Arvas. Um, beyond this, there is a much deeper influence of Tamil. Uh, actually, it's almost a pre-Tamil influence on Sanskrit. And that is that both Tamil and Sanskrit derived many of their ideas and poetic conventions from a folk literature which existed in the Deccan. Um, and that literature probably, or that culture probably flourished around the first century uh, BCE. Let's talk about age, because everyone is always thinking of how old languages are. The earliest Tamil we have is maybe as early as 200 BCE. Now, they may have had writing earlier than that, but unfortunately, we don't have anything from before that date. Sanskrit, the earliest writing is um, the Rig Veda, which probably goes back to about 1500 BCE. Everyone in India is extremely, uh, or many people in India are, are extremely concerned about the age of things. Um, and I think it, it's a corrective to remark that there are much older literatures than either Sanskrit or Tamil. Uh, Chinese, Sumerian, Egyptian, Akkadian, uh, some of them go back as early as 4000 BCE. Um, but I'd also point out to everyone that the worth of a language and its literature has nothing whatsoever to do with its age. You couldn't compare Kamban or Shakespeare with something 6,000 years old in Sumerian, which is just a list of payments to a temple or something like that. 
Um, it's also important to remark that languages are always changing. They're always, and, and this is especially true before the modern age of uh, when we had books and now we have uh, movies and internet and TV and everything. But um, Sanskrit developed from Indo-European and Indo-European was spoken somewhere around the modern Ukraine. And it's at least 6,000 years old. Tamil developed from Proto-Dravidian, which was probably native to India and most likely is as old as Indo-European. Many people think that the Indus Valley civilization spoke Dravidian. Uh, there's no certain confirmation of that at this point. Let's talk about the origins of the two literatures, because this is really where things become uh, more interesting. Uh, Sanskrit, when we look at the Rig Veda and the Vedas in general and the uh, Brahmanas and the Adhanyakas and all of those things, the earliest things in Sanskrit, uh, they are, for the most part, uh, they're magical religious. That is, they are chants and magical formulae which are meant to uh, which are meant to have certain results. For example, to make it rain or to defeat enemies, or simply to keep the universe functioning as it should. Um, when we look at the Vedas, there are some things in them which are very beautiful. There are a few hymns in the Rig Veda which are beautiful, but much of it is simply liturgical, as the first verse of the Rig Veda, Agni mire purohitam yajnasya deva martvijam. I sing of Agni, the Ritvik, the god of um, of the sacrifice, the Ritwik, and so forth. It's fairly, um, well, you wouldn't call it poetic. It's interesting if you're interested in literature, but uh, for the most part, it's not terribly poetic, but there are notable exceptions. But this origin of Sanskrit really pervades the language uh, even when it's used by other groups, it, it tends to have some of this Vedic uh, background remains. Tamil, on the other hand, did not come from this kind of background. It came from a folk literature. And the folk literature described normal, everyday village life, what people felt, what they thought how they suffered, what they had to go through. When we com that means that when we compare Sanskrit and Tamil, we're really talking about remark totally different things. It's like comparing apples and oranges. Uh, it's tough to compare them because they're very different and they do different things and they arose in different ways. Um, when we look at both languages, and this is true of many languages, actually most languages, for example, if we look at Greek, all language, languages tend to have foundational documents, documents which are basic to the language and almost synonymous with the language. In Greek, we can look at the two great epics of Homer. In um, in Sanskrit, if we look at the things which really form the basis of the language, uh, we can look at the Vedas, and after that, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Now, of these, what is truly great literature? The Mahabharata stands far above any of the Vedas or the Ramayana, 
as great literature. The, Ram, the Mahabharata is really an amazing thing. Um, and um, it, it describes the entire culture of its time and really also in the Gita and other places creates a template for later culture. Now, when we look at Tamil, we also have a foundational literature, and that is far and away Sangam literature, and also Kamban's great Yiramavadaram, Kamban's Ramayanam. Uh, both of these are among the world's greatest literature. And I've actually, in my opinion, Kamban was the greatest of all Indian poets and one of the truly great poets of the world. Um, Kamban also, like the Sanskrit Mahabharata, sums up the culture of his age uh, in, in amazing ways. Uh, there's, they say there's nothing under the sun that's not in the Mahabharata. One could say the same thing of Kamban. Now let's look at Sanskrit for a bit. Sanskrit became the lingua franca of half of the world. Well, perhaps a little less than half, but South Asia uh, and Southeast Asia and other areas uh, used Sanskrit. Uh, Buddhists wrote, started writing in Sanskrit. Uh, Sanskrit has its ancient Vedic heritage, which... Uh, which really pervades the language. Um, it also has the fir first comprehensive grammar of any human language. Uh, Pandani is often said to be the beginning of, mo of the modern science of linguistics. Pandani took Sanskrit and he, he, um, he described all of the elements of its grammar in a most amazing way. It also has um, epics and uh, Puranas, and it has literature on almost every imaginable topic. In other words, uh, it was like Latin in medieval Europe. It became a language that was used in all over the place because people couldn't understand each other. And so they used Sanskrit and they, if you wanted to write something which other people would read, you would write it in Sanskrit, just as Newton had to write Principia in Latin so that other people in Europe could understand it. Uh, Sanskrit was not a spoken language after the Vedas and the epics. Um, it's literature after, uh, it has a few great poets. Kalidasa, of course, is the greatest. Uh, but after that, it's literature tends to be precious and complicated and somewhat unnatural. It's, you don't feel like you're reading great literature. You're feeling like sometimes as if you were solving a crossword puzzle when you read some later Sanskrit works. Um, now, one thing very important about Sanskrit is that just about everything in it, when we look at literature, we don't include things like uh, darshanam or philosophy, virtually all of its literature is oriented toward the other world. Uh, you don't get descriptions of people, what, what happened to someone in everyday life. It's always about gods, about mythological people. Um, much of the literature as time went on became very technical because people were basically writing technical things for everyone else. Uh, let's look at Tamil. Tamil was a spoken language from the beginning of its literature to the present. Its earliest literature describes real life and real people. This, I, I can't emphasize this too much. Uh, when you read poems in the Ahananura, and we'll come to that in a little bit, it is simply amazing 
how um, you you feel like you're living in an Indian village of two or a Tamil village of two thousand years ago. It's it's amazing how real these poems are, and they describe real people. The Puranan order is about people who actually lived. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, it it gives extraordinary insights into human psychology. The Ahanan order, for example, really describes it. It paints pictures of how human beings perceive things and process things. It also concerns the, hum the human condition of ordinary people, not of gods. It is marked by a, an extraordinary vitality of expression, and that has, that's connected to its being a spoken language. Uh, when you read some of Sangam literature or Kamban or any of the great authors, you come across uh, sayings which are, are really remarkable in, in how uh, you, you can think of, of course, everybody thinks of the uh, Tirukural. Tirukural is a good example of how Tamil is able to compress things down to a small uh, few words and say so much. And that brings us to the fifth strength. It's ethical literature. There's nothing like Tirukural in any other language. Um, now, Tamil, being a, a real language, was confined to Tamil-speaking areas. Um, it tended, as time went on, it, it stopped having this amazing immediacy of the Sangam poems and uh, didn't really describe real people. But then when we come to great authors like Kamban, he makes them his character is so real that you feel that you know them. So Tamil also had a tendency to become artificial. This is something perhaps that happens to many literatures like Sanskrit, but its great authors tended to avoid that problem. Now, let's look, and I know I don't want to take up too much time because you want to ask some questions. So uh, I'll go through this rather fast, but let's look at a simple example. I, I was tempted to put in something more complex, but I think for a short talk like this, this will do it. Um, when we, um, in the Puranan order, I think most of you probably know the great story of, um, uh, of Bari and of Kabila. Uh, Bari was uh, the poet laureate um, of a king. Uh, sorry, not Bari. Uh, Kabila was the poet laureate of the uh, Mannan, of the small king Bari. Bari ruled a mountain called Parambu. And um, the three great kings, the Soran, the, the Sera Soran and Pandian kings, came and attacked Bari and eventually took his mountain and killed him, leaving behind his daughters. Uh, and Gumban, the story is, took the daughters around to different kingdoms and was able to marry them off. Well, actually, uh, we finally had to find someone else, not kings, to marry them. Um, and this is, so there's a whole series of poems in the Puranan order about the Pari story. And they're very graphic and they're very real because it's as if you were there at the time when you read them. This is, Kamban speaking of, of uh, Parambu, the great hill that Pari ruled. Alido tane perirum kundre, velin verul vendar ko varide, nila tinay malar pureyum mungat kinay mahat kelida, pardinal varine. 
if you read this in Tamil, it's so moving that uh, it, it's just a very moving poem, as many poems in the Puranan order are. Of course, the great dark hill is to be pitied. To conquer it by the spear would be hard for kings, but easy to win for a woman with a drum, her blackened eyes like two blue sat water lilies, if she comes to it singing. And what, what the poet here is saying is that Pari was so generous that if you want, if, if you want his kingdom, then you just go as a performing woman and sing to him and he'll give you the whole kingdom. But if you come and try to take it by force, you'll never be able to do it. Uh, this, of course, uh, brings to the fore the great generosity of Bari, who, who, and it, it said that the reason that he was attacked by the three kings was they were jealous of his, of his generosity. Uh, now, subsequently, uh, Parambu fell and Bari was killed. And that left behind his daughters. And one of the great poems of all world literature, in my opinion, is attributed to Bari's daughters, though one has to assume that it was really written by Kabir. Um, and what these daughters say is they are describing the world before their father died and after their father died. And as they do it, they bring, they, they tell us something which all of us experience, which is the world doesn't change, but we change and our circumstances change. And this is what they say. And I'm going to read the English first. On that day, under the white light of that moon, we had our father and no enemies had taken the hill. On this day, under the white light of this moon, the king's royal drums beating out the victory have taken the hill, and we, we have no father. Atrei tingal avven nilaven yendayum mudayim kundrum pirat kolar. Yitrei tingal yivven nilaven Venruri Murasil Vendar Yem Kundrum Kundar Yam Yendayum Ilame. Incidentally, if you look at this picture of these drums, you get some notion of how terrifying an army must have been with the drums beating and the elephants and everything. Um, but look at this poem. It's, it's, a perfect poem. Now, there are not many poems you can say are perfect in the world, but this is one of them. And what really animates this poem is the next to last line. Vendreri murasin vendariyam. You hear how the rhythm uh, imitates the beating of a drum. So this is... Um, uh, this is an example of how a truly great poem can work in Tamil. This is, uh, this is one of the great poems of the world. Now, I have this, I don't have, I want to have time for questions. So what I thought I will do is simply, simply read a poem from the Ahanan order, which is rather fun and enjoyable and is not so complicated. Ahanan Uru poems tend to be very complex and we don't really have time to go into them. But this poem by Paranar is a, a very nice poem and it shows you a bit of how the Ahanan Uru works. Um, this poem is attributed to a woman who 
in, in Sangam literature, in Kurinji poems, uh, generally a woman and a man have fallen in love with each other, but no one else that knows about it, or they're trying to keep their relationship secret uh, because in ancient Tamil Nadu, people were not supposed to have relationships before they got married. So the, but, but still they're in love with each other. So they want to meet. And the hero is often comes at night and he sneaks in and sees his, his uh, beloved and then leaves. Or sometimes he may meet her somewhere else during the day. In this case, he was supposed to meet her at night and the heroine speaks. And she says, this noisy town where palm wine flows like rain doesn't sleep even if there is no festival. And even if the rich markets and the streets sleep, mother with her harsh words and piercing voice doesn't sleep. And even if mother who watches over me so carefully, I feel tied up sleeps, the guards of the town, their eyes unsleeping, move about swiftly. And even if those young men with their bright spears sleep, the dogs, their teeth sharp, their tails curved to the right, bark. And even if the dogs with their loud barking sleep, a huge moon, bright as day, spreads with its light in the sky. And even if the moon sets behind its mountain and thick darkness falls, a loud-voiced owl living on the rats in our house screeches fearfully in the middle of the night when spirits roam. And even if that owl who lives in a hole should happen to sleep, the good voice of a cock that lives in our house calls out. One day. When everything was asleep, he, with his fickle heart, failed to come. And so, friend, our love is hopeless. Blocked in so many ways, like the rock-filled guard forest of Waldurande, city ruled by Titan with his fine horses that gallop at the speed of Adi, moving swiftly so the pebble-filled ornamental rings on their legs rattle. Um, one could say a lot about that poem. It's a it's a wonderful poem, but I think the nice thing also about it is that it's easy to understand. Uh, and when we come to the end, you see how it brings into the poem something that's real: the Titan uh, ruling Urande and his horses that gallop. And also notice the sound of of the, the, the that is is brought forth all right so let's i'm i'm about, let's finish and talk about uh sanskrit and tamil sanskrit is an indo-european language it's related to most european languages including english brother is brother in english and so forth People speaking an early form of Sanskrit entered South Asia around 1500 BCE, and that's the people who wrote the Rig Veda. The earliest work in Sanskrit is the Rig Veda, which is a collection of 1,009 hymns to the deities worshipped by the Vedic people. Sanskrit was described or, and or prescribed by Panini, probably 4th or 5th century BCE. And his motivation was to grammatically describe the Vedas and also the more modern Sanskrit of his time. The Prakrits were used widely in India. And as many of you know, the... Um, Pallavas, their inscriptions are mainly in Prakrit, even though they were in the Tamil area. The Prakrits were used widely in, uh, until the Guptas, 4th or 5th, so the 6th century CE, uh, who elevated the use of Sanskrit and patronized the greatest writers in the language, like Kalidasa. Uh, 
After about the third or fourth century CE, Sanskrit became a lingua franca of much of the world used for Buddhism as well as Brahminical culture and almost all non-religious subjects as well. Um, the, um, uh, it's important, by the way, to remark that the other languages of India all de started developing and having literatures about a thousand CE. This was long after Sanskrit became a uh, language of uh, culture in general. And so when you look at uh, the Telugu, Kannada, uh, North Indian languages, they tend to use a lot of Sanskrit words which they borrow and they also uh, model themselves on Sanskrit. Tamil did not do that because it started much earlier, uh, before Sanskrit became so overwhelming. Literature was composed in Tamil starting about 300 BCE, long before Sanskrit became a lingua franca. Sanskrit literature was, Sangam literature was written by people who used folk themes, ideas, and events in the villages around them. Just as Sanskrit was described by Panini, Tamil grammar was described by Tulhapir, who also described all the literary conventions and usages of the language. Um, this is important because uh, no other Indian language has anything like Tulhapiam except for Sanskrit. Uh, they do have grammatical works, uh, works about their grammar, but all are modeled on Sanskrit. Tamil is preserved. Now, this is another thing people, some, uh, everybody knows this, but they don't think about it. Tamil has preserved its own phonemic system, unlike other Dravidian languages. Um, you know, Sanskrit has uh, ka, ka, ga, ga, whereas Tamil simply has one sound there, ka. And when Tamil is written, it sometimes people criticize it for that, but that's a mistake because Tamil is simply writing the language as it is pronounced. Um, I remember Malayali, he, he couldn't pronounce the Sanskrit sounds, but he wrote them. Whereas in Tamil, they're not written because they're not in the language. And that, that's a telltale sign of its age and how it developed. It's, Tamil is also the only language in India that becomes more sophisticated by using its own vocabulary instead of Sanskrit. If you want to say clean and normal everyday Tamil, you say suddham or suddham. Uh, but if you want to say it in elevated language, you say tuime. And similarly with a word like describe, varnikirin. But if I want to say it in an elegant way, I use pure Tamil and so forth. Um, this gives the language a power and a continuity. And this is something which is special about Tamil, that today, almost 2,000 years after Varlavar, people not only understand the Kural, but the words have much the same effect that it would have had on Varlavar. When I read the Puranaunuru poems, uh, Tamils can still understand them. This is amazing. I mean, this is 2,000 years. The language has changed, of course, uh, but still there's that ability to understand the ancient language. The Tamil language is enormously expressive. For all its richness, Sanskrit has no words to convey accurately the meanings of the words of, of well, of all the words of the Kuror. Um, actually, English doesn't either, but it maybe does a better language because it's spoken and so has uh, resources of a spoken language. So let's end by saying, what is Tamil? From the earliest time, Tamil speakers saw themselves as what we might term a nationality. 
separate from others in India and elsewhere. This is an argument I've had with many scholars. I had it with Narayana Rao, who's a great Telugu scholar. And he kept saying, oh, nobody ever thought of language in India until modern times. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, they, they just, they just spoke their language, but it didn't really give them their identity. Well, this is not true of Tamil. When we go back to Sangam literature, we find again and again uh, talking about how the language changes in these terrible places to the north. Uh, we find a notion of being Tamil, which is very strong and which is very pronounced. And this persists. If you read Sirapadiyaram, what do you have? You all have all three great uh, Tamil kings, Sarasora Pandya and the Chere king going north and putting the mark uh, of Kanihi, uh, put, putting his mark, sorry, on the, on the Himalayas. Uh, this notion of Tamils as a separate entity is very old. Um, other groups in South Asia, we don't see that. Uh, we don't find in, in someone from UP saying, you know, our language and our culture is different. But Tamils have done this for 2,000 years. Of course, at the same time, the Tamils saw themselves as part of South Asia. Um, and in Zangam literature, that's very clear. Uh, and to this day, this tends to be true. Tamils are both Indians, but they are also Tamil. And uh, the perhaps one of the most fortunate things about India is that it's able to accommodate all of the different groups who live in it and let them uh, nourish their own identity as both Indians and as Tamils or whatever else they might be. Uh, but what sets Tamil people apart is their language and their history. If you go into, oh, you, uh, you can go into some place in Tamil Nadu and talk to someone who's just marginally literate, but he'll still know something about Tamil and, and its history and its literature. Um, Tamils have an identity that is better defined and clearer than any group in South Asia. And this is the Tani Sirap of Tamil. Okay, thank you, Professor Hart, for that fascinating presentation. We can surely go on listening to you for a long time, but uh, many people have submitted questions and I'll put some of those forward to you. Before that, I want to give an update that right now we have 507 people logged on. Now the organizers told me that the maximum the Zoom facility can accommodate is 500. So apparently many people have not been able to log in and they have been texting the organizers about getting in. So this of course is a very happy problem and surely a testament to the love and respect that the public have for Professor Hart. And uh, uh, even though he has been fully retired for five years now. Okay, so now let me uh, start with, uh, okay, the two questions, the first two questions are related to each other. So I'll just, okay. How did Sanskrit reach the South? Who brought it and who adopted it first and why? Okay, so how did Sanskrit reach the South? Who brought it and who adopted it first and why? And the related question is, was the relationship between Sanskrit and Tamil ever adversarial in the pre-modern period? Was it harmonious or was it adversarial? Okay, so, uh, you know, this, uh, one could give uh, several lectures on each one of these questions. Um, the first question, my own, my own opinion is um, that if you look at Sangam times, there was a great deal of chaos. People were, there were kings, there were warlords, there were kings, they were trying to conquer other people. Uh, and there was a problem also with the legitimacy of kings. How do you, 
How do you become a great king? What makes you uh, accepted as a king so that people listen to what you say? Um, and one of the reasons Sanskrit spread was because they had a wonderful solution to this problem. And incidentally, this is behind the spread of Sanskrit, not only to South India, but to other areas like Thailand, where there are still Brahmins in the royal court of the Thai king. Um, what, the, what Sanskrit had, uh, and it was part of the culture of a group of the of the Brahmins who had come, who were actually brought to South India by kings. Uh, and what they had was amazing rituals that could uh, that could legitimize a king. There's one king in Sangam literature, Yeraya Suya Veta Perunat Kili. Perunat Kili who sat, who who celebrated the Rajasuya, the Brahminical uh, rite that makes you a king. And the, the kings were able to use Brahmins and Brahminical culture and Sanskrit, which came along with it, to legitimize themselves. And I think this is one way, and perhaps one of the major ways, in which Sanskrit entered into the cultures of South India. And, um, you know, as, as in all human cultures, nothing, nothing is pure and nothing is really separate from anything else. People borrow things from, uh, and, you know, uh, cultures change and they evolve and off, off, uh, they always evolve uh, borrow, by borrowing. And that, that's what happened in South India also. But I think that the notion of legitimization of kingship and also the fact that after the Guptas, a Sanskrit uh, or a Brahminical, well, not really a Brahminical culture, but the Hindu culture uh, was seen as a for source for stability. Uh, in order to avoid the kind of warlordism that you saw under the... Uh, in Sangam times, and actually it did continue until later, uh, you needed a strong king and a social structure which was coherent and which worked against the kind of chaotic culture that we often see in Sangam times. Uh, so this is one answer to that. Now, next question. Was Sanskrit and Tamil uh, adversarial? No, I don't think so. I think that this notion of Sanskrit and Tamil being adversarial, you, you don't see, I, I've never seen that. Occasionally, I think there are, uh, there are sort of hints of it in maybe starting around 1600, 1700, but certainly in Kamban, he never felt that. Kamban says he's, you know, he called Sanskrit the Devapade, the, the, speech of the gods and and he talks of Valmiki in, in very flattering words and then he goes on to completely change Valmiki and write something that except for the storyline has very little in common with Val, Valmiki if anything so uh, I don't see any adversarial relationship there okay thank you professor now the next question uh, do you have any views on the recent dating of the Tamil Brahmi script to the mid first millennium BCE on the basis of excavations at sites like Porundal, Kodumanal, and Kiladi? How important was writing in Sangam society? Do we have any insights on writing from Sangam literature? So basically, the dating of first millennium BC, how important was writing in Sangam society? And do you have any insights on writing from Sangam literature? Okay, so I'm not, I, I can't really comment on the origins of Brahmi because I'm, I'm not a, I haven't gone into that in great detail. So I just won't say anything. The, the work being done is interesting. And uh, I don't think it's been fully accepted by every, all the scholars, but I'm just not qualified to really remark on it. 
As far as writing in Sangam times, yes, we have we have mentions of writing, uh, for example, on hero stones. But there's much more to writing when we uh, when we look at the poems, and that is, it seems quite clear that the poets are often imitating folk genres. Folk, and this is especially true of the Aham poems, but also of the great uh, uh, poems that praise kings, uh, that um, are the Puram poems. Uh, the, the, what, what we see in these poems is uh, what we, the same thing that we see in, um, in Homer and in other other poets who, who were the first really to use their language is that they they definitely had to use writing. There's no way they could have written those long poems and simply done it without being able to write. They were certainly written down, uh, but they were imitating folk things which were oral. And this is true of other literatures as well. Uh, so, uh, yes, there there is a notion that writing that people were writing these things down, uh, and I think that is you know just looking at the nature of the poems and how they work, uh, they must have been written down. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't really know how they were performed. It's it's rather sad uh, that we don't. Um, you know, it's interesting. Just marking uh, parenthetically, the um, the Devaram and the poems of Namarvar, uh, the um, Tiruvai Mori, were originally sung in different puns or what we would call ragas today. Um, but when the Tiruvai Mori was made into the Tamil Vedas, they now recite, if you go to a Sri to one of the great Vishnu temples like Tirupati, you'll hear, you'll hear a Namarvar recited and they recited as if it were the Vedas. They use the same, same way that they recite the Rig Veda, uh, which is in, an interesting, uh, just an interesting fact. Uh, that takes quite a bit away from the from the poetic quality of Namarvar, but that's neither here nor there, but it's an interesting fact. Okay, thank you, Professor. Now, uh, the next question, did organized religion exist in Sangam society? Uh, well, the question is, does organized religion exist any time in Tamil society? A uh, Hindu is simply someone who's not Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, right? And, um, you know, we, how do you define a Hindu? Is a, a I, I would say no. There is, there, there were ideas from, there were definitely Jain ideas in, especially Tirukkural may have been written by a Jain. But I don't. And it may be that Jainism and Buddhism were more organized, but no, the, I don't think the general religion was more organized any more then than it is now. If you go into a Tamil village, uh, you have everything from people going to the, you know, to a temple, the Shiva or Vishnu or whatever, to uh, you know, to local village deities, and there's no real connecting link between them, except that they all belong to the same culture and society. So you don't have organized religion in the same way you do in the West, where you have Christians and Muslims and things like that. Okay, thank you, Professor. Now we've reached one hour, but we have over 100 questions on the chat box. So uh, we, uh, is it okay to continue for 10 more minutes and we just ask? Yeah, we can go on for a bit more. Okay, thank you. So, uh, did, uh, okay, did caste exist in the Sangam period? I know you've written some papers on this topic and it's also a, a highly uh, sensitive and political issue. So did caste exist in the Sangam period? 
I, I should just pass on that question, Letra. Uh, my, you know, my my own my, you know, if you if you look at all old cultures, um, you, you don't you don't get modern ideas of human rights. I've been reading a lot about the Romans and their cultures and. Um, the culture really ran on slaves. There were probably twice as many slaves as anyone else. And if you owned a slave, not only could you do anything you wanted with them, you could kill them and no one would say a thing. Um, the old cultures tend, tend to be um, socially, ha have social degradation, uh, social gradations. And I think this was just as true of, of the culture of Sangam times as it is in modern times. Uh, when the, the Sangam poems themselves talk about uh, people of low birth, they talk about Yirisinar, which in spite of all of the attempts to change its meaning or uh, see, definitely seems to mean people who are marginalized or who are lower in status, they talk about um, uh, they talk about puleir. Pule is an old word which does not come from puli, but is an old South Dravidian word, which means uh, dangerous magical power and the power associated with the spirit world, uh, which has to be controlled. And every every culture of ancient times had these beliefs. It's not just the Tamils. The Romans were, were always, uh, they, they were looking at omens every time they turned around. And so were the Greeks. Uh, so was everybody else. So were the Chinese. Um, so the other thing is in Sangam literature, we have names of occupations of many of them. And you get the sense reading it that these are probably hereditary. You didn't get fishermen who suddenly became carpenters. They remain fishermen as they do today in villages. And um, so I would say that the caste system, and by that I mean kudi or jati, not, not the varna system. Varna system is something totally different. But the caste system where each occupation has its own sort of uh, place and its own duties and its own identity, I'd say it does go back to Sangam times. But as you know, people argue about it and uh, I don't want, I'll just leave it at that. That's my, my take on it. Okay, thank you, Professor. Now, uh, the next question is, did Tamil ever have a wider reach in South Asia? So this is a little bit turning the, the normal assumption on its head. Was it ever used in the North? Uh, only by people who went there from Tamil Nadu. Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't, I mean, the, the interesting thing there is if we look at, let's look at um, at Malaysia, Indonesia, that area, and also Cambodia. Now, Tamils were, we, we know that in probably a long time, there's been a lot of trade uh, between different areas in South Asia and also Southeast Asia. And actually, if you, if you want, you can look at the Gujaratis. The Gujaratis, People who lived in Gujarat, even in Indus Valley times, 4,000 years ago, they were trading all over the place uh, to the west of them. Uh, similarly, when we look at these excavations in Tamil Nadu that may go back to 500 BCE, we, see, we also see trade going on between Tamil Nadu and North India. So I think Tamil was spread by traders uh, to, and there are some words in, um, in Indonesian, in Javanese and things, which are Tamil words. 
But when people in those places wanted to write inscriptions, uh, they didn't use Tamil. Tamils, if the Tamils were there, they might have, but they used uh, Sanskrit because Sanskrit was the language which was used commonly between different areas. So uh, whether Tamil was, Tamil, however, was spoken in Sri Lanka uh, in, from the earliest times, because we have poets in Sangam, in the Sangam anthologies who came from Sri Lanka. Iritta Pudandrivanar is one of them. Uh, so uh, definitely Sri Lanka has spoken Tamil for a long time. But I don't think that is true, except for trading groups in other areas. Uh, the Chetiyars are an example, as you know, of a modern trading group who had a lot of contacts outside India, both Burma and in uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. That's how come you guys are all speaking Tamil. <laughs> Okay, thank you. You preempted my next question. So let me add on to that and say now. Uh, so the, was the, the mood question is was Tamil brought by one group of people to Southeast Asia and Sanskrit by another group of people, or was it brought by the same group of people? Maybe the Tamils brought both languages to Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, I don't know that what what I would suspect happened was. You know, Sanskrit became so prestigious that it spread fairly naturally. And I would guess that the kings in, this is just a guess, by the way, I don't know enough to say this for sure, that, that Brahmins were imported by the kings to give them legitimacy and that uh, this legitimacy also you know, spread to the use of Sanskrit, that if you wanted to write something which was, which really had a lot of uh, uh, power, you would use Sanskrit because that goes back to the Vedas and has so much power. Um, the people who brought Tamil were probably traders and they probably were not so much connected with the spread of Sanskrit as they were just traders who were using Tamil and some of their words entered into the native people in, of, of Indonesia and other places. Oh, there is one other thing though that needs to be remarked. And that's if you go back much earlier, uh, the influence of Dravidian on Sanskrit is very, very marked, especially in sounds, that is phonology, and in structure of things, that is syntax. Sanskrit of uh, compounds mirror uh, Dravidian word order, Tamil word order, Telugu word order, doesn't matter what language, almost exactly. And there are, even in the Rig Veda, usages, syntactical usages, which seem to be borrowed from Dravidian. There are also Dravidian words in Sanskrit, more and more as time goes on, borrowed from Dravidian. And um, the whole, the retroflex consonants, uh, what they call, uh, I think the Sanskrit word is Murdhanya, uh, na, ta, as in uh, uh, part two, uh, those those are um, those were probably borrowed from Dravidian, and so Sanskrit has been very very deeply affected by Dravidian, uh, not only in borrowing words but it, much more even in syntax. Thank you. And you know, your, I, if I was to uh, uh, your, your respond, rephrase your response to the question on Tamil and Sanskrit. So your proposition is that Tamil came via traders to Southeast Asia and Sanskrit came by religious people who could have come from anywhere in India. Uh, you know, whether the Buddhists or the Jains or who could have come from any centers of those religions. Uh, well, actually, we know where they came from. The, the interesting thing is that the alphabets of 
Southeast Asia, which are Indian origin, are of Pallava origin. So they, their main link was with South India. The, um, the Sinhalese, of course, trace themselves to uh, Orissa, but, but how, how true that is, I don't know. Okay. Okay, so now this is the last question I have for you. Uh, why did Sanskrit become the more dominant intellectual and political language of India and Southeast Asia in pre-modern times? Though both were ancient, why did Sanskrit eventually become the dominant language? Um, well, very simple, because uh, Sanskrit... It, it, this is connected with the spread of Sanskrit, the, the fact that kings invited Brahmins to, in order to attain a kind of legitimacy which they couldn't get any other way, and the fact that Sanskrit was common to all the languages. As, as time went on, when, when the uh, local languages developed, they looked to Sanskrit because you had this great tradition of, uh, of the Vedas, of the epics, of other things. And they didn't know a thing about Tamil. Tamil was off in the south. And the only people who knew about Tamil were people who spoke Tamil. Uh, it was quite uh, pretty much uh, that simple. And to this day, one of the things which bothers me about India is that people outside uh, Tamil Nadu uh, simply don't want to accept the fact that Tamil is an important classical language. It's, it's a, I don't know why. Uh, in, um, in the West, nobody has a problem. English people realize that Latin and Greek are their classical languages. Why shouldn't someone in UP realize that Tamil and Sanskrit are the classical languages of India? But they don't. They simply know about Sanskrit, and Tamil for them is something that may as well be spoken on Mars. And, uh, you know, that's just one of the quirks of India. It's, it's rather sad, and one wishes uh, that it would change. But, um, but so far, uh, and even Sanskrit, you know, one of the things that sets Sanskrit apart is that it sees itself as a sort of, as a, a phenomenon which is unconnected to anything else. It may have influenced other things, but it was not influenced by anything else. And when you get people like Ramanuja and Shankara, both of whom spoke Tamil natively, they write only in Sanskrit, they never mention anything else. I mean, you would never know reading Shankara or Ramanuja that they were Tamilians. Uh, this is one of the things about Sanskrit which annoys, I think it annoys Tamils, uh, is that there's a, almost an arrogance about Sanskrit where you don't want to accept any other language. Sanskrit is Sanskrit and nothing else approaches it. Uh, this, of course, is a bit, I mean, this is... I think, um, I don't know, it's just how things developed. Uh, the, it, it, you see similar thing with Latin in medieval Europe, that if anybody wanted to show they were educated, they had to not only write in Latin, they even had to speak Latin. Um, probably wasn't much like the Latin the ancient Romans spoke, but it was still the same language, more or less. And uh, this is perhaps something that happens with these languages that become, that, that cease being spoken and become a lingua franca of a large area. But the fact is, uh, Tamil really exists, uh, or knowledge of Tamil is very, very scant outside of Tamil Nadu. Okay. I, did you want to finish off? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Professor Hart. That's a very good note to end off. And uh, uh, I, I guess we, uh, everyone, many people in the audience, I'm sure will be uh, appreciative of the fact that you are one uh, 
single scholar in the uh, in the West who has been consistently supporting the cause of Tamil to be recognized as a classical language. And you have surely made a difference. So thank you on behalf of uh, everyone in the audience. Now, uh, we have uh, now crossed you, the one hour. Yeah? Can, can I just say one final thing? Mm -hmm. please. Yes, please. Um, yeah, the, the one thing that um, I'd like to just give a bit of credit to A.K. Ramanujan. A.K. Ramanujan uh, uh, was, he grew up in, in I think in, uh, in either Bangalore or Mysore, I'm not in, in Karnataka. He became a Kannada poet. Uh, he also was a Shakespearean scholar. And he grew up speaking Tamil at home. And when he got older, he, he discovered Sangam literature. And he was really the one who started the study of Tamil as a classical language in the West. I was lucky to spend some time working one-on-one -on -one with A.K. Ramanujan when I was a student. One summer I did that. And I remember he would talk about classical Tamil all the time. This is long before anybody thought of Tamil as a classical language. Um, he, he really brought the awareness of the language to the West. And I think uh, we should all, you know, if you read his works, his translations, they're very wonderful. And um, I think it's, it's a good thing to give him some credit. And the other thing where we have to uh, give credit where credit is due is the long tradition of Tamil scholars and the extraordinary learning that exists in the Tamil language. And, you know, those of us who write in English are simply, um, are simply using their work to do what we do. Uh, but the Tamils have done an extraordinary job in keeping their literature going. Uh, this is something which, uh, which needs to be remarked on because we're all grateful to the people who spent their lives keeping this great tradition going. So that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Hart for sharing that anecdote. I think this is a, a wonderful example of how uh, passion Light's passion, you know, the passion of A.K. Ramanujam, Professor A.K. Ramanujam, lit the passion of Professor Hart. And tonight, Professor Hart has lit the passion of the 500 of us in the audience to know much more about this topic. Okay, uh, we have now crossed the one hour time limit and I wish to thank Professor uh, Hart for extending it for another 20 minutes. Now there were over a hundred questions which were asked. Unfortunately, we were only able to entertain about 10 questions. So my apologies for those questions for which we were not able to put forward to Professor Hutt, but thank you for submitting them. Uh, now, um, uh, I think one of the things uh, in the Q&A session that I appreciate about Professor Hutt's response was he answered everything directly. He, uh, he did not uh, try to uh, uh, go around questions and uh, as though some of them were quite sensitive. So thank you, Professor Hart. And uh, after this session, there's a post-survey form. So I hope that as many of you can fill up the form. And if we know what is your interest, uh, we can put it forward to Professor Hart that in future, maybe he will be able to give uh, more talks of this nature. And uh, last of all, if you want to read his letter, just Google Professor Hart uh, letter on classical Tamil. Uh, you should be able to find it. So without uh, further ado, uh, okay, let me uh, finally end off by thanking the organizers. Uh, firstly, CSTC, the Center for Singapore Tamil Culture, who arranged this event. Next, the National Library Board, who provided all the infrastructure to run this event. We couldn't have done it without their support. And as it is, they are maxing out of the 500 uh, they have a big account of 500 people, but even that was maxed out. So we may have to use a larger one the next time around. Uh, we thank Professor Hart for giving off his time and knowledge so generously at such an early hour in the morning. And most of all, you, the audience, 
without whom this event could not have been the success it has been. Thank you and good night. Thank you.